So, uh, hi everyone. Welcome to uh, the Matara Center for International Studies uh, book talk on uh, John Eikenberry's uh, new work, A World Safe for Democracy. Uh, I'm Dan Nexon, and I'm going to be hosting uh, this event or co hosting it, but I'm going to be moderating it. Uh, and we're very pleased to not only have uh, John talking about his book, but also uh, Professor Stacy Goddard. Uh, of Wellesley College, who will be providing uh, some comments uh, before we move to a general Q&A. Uh, just a couple of quick notes before I do a little bit more of a formal introduction of the, the speakers. Uh, we are uh, in webinar form, which means that if you have questions, the best way to get them to me is to type them in the Q&A option, which I'll be monitoring and I'll try to pass on as many of those questions as I can, uh, particularly once we actually enter the Q&A. Uh, I'll also try to monitor the chat, but it's a little bit more difficult to, to keep my eye on both things. So do try to use the Q&A. Uh, to uh, if you have questions you want to pass on for the, the panelists. Um, and uh, so uh, so anyway, uh, 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 John Eikenberry is the uh, Albert G. Milbank Professor of Politics and International Affairs at Princeton University in the Department of Politics and the Princeton School of Public International Affairs. He is also the co-director of Princeton Center for International Security Studies. Uh, he has then a long list of accolades and titles and fellowships uh, that follow his name. Uh, if you don't know his work, he's probably the one of the two, along with his frequent co-author, leading scholars of liberal internationalism uh, and liberal hegemony uh, in, in the field. Uh, and he has uh, he's served in government. Uh, he uh, is the resident book reviewer, one of the resident book reviewers for foreign affairs. Uh, and we're very pleased to have him with us uh, talking about this. Um, we're also extremely pleased to have uh, Professor Stacy Goddard, who is the, uh, the uh, Mildred Lane Kemper Professor of Political Science uh, at Wellesley College and the Faculty du Director for the uh, Madeline uh, uh, Corbel Albright Institute for uh, Global Affairs, which gives her uh, an, an interesting Georgetown uh, connection. Uh, she does research on international security with a focus on legitimacy, rising powers and territorial conflict. Uh, her most recent book, which is a really terrific book and you should go read it, is When Right Makes Right, Rising Powers and World Order. Uh, she also, I must say, has uh, excellent taste in co-authors. Uh, so without that, uh, th without out of the way, as does John, actually, with that out of the way, um, uh, uh, Professor Eikenberry will talk for about 15 minutes about his book, uh, and then we'll get about, you know, five to seven minute co minutes of comments to get us uh, kicked off from uh, Professor Goddard, uh, and then we'll open it up. So, uh, so John, take it away. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, uh, Stacy, for, for being here and, and letting us uh, talk about this book. Uh, um, very briefly, let me just say something about the book. It really began as a set of lectures at the University of Virginia uh, in November of uh, uh, 2016, so right after the, the election. And it was really a set of lectures that I was asked to give on the crisis of liberal internationalism. And uh, soon thereafter, I saw myself, and during those lectures and in the aftermath, realizing that the questions at stake were broader than sort of what's going to happen tomorrow, but we were in a, a more world historical moment. Uh, the system, the global system was transforming, it still is in various ways breaking down in real time. We're asking, and in some sense being forced to ask these mo most basic questions uh, about international order. What are the sources of order? Uh, what are the prospects for liberal democracy? Uh, what uh, is, are the, 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 what is the fate or the prospects for liberal internationalism as a way of thinking about and organizing the international system? And in particular, what is the ground given all that has happened? Uh, the ups and downs, the successes and failures, what is the ground upon which liberal internationalism can, can plant its flag? And so uh, I see this as a moment when we're asking these most basic questions, we're going back and we're reading our car, and our Morgenthau and our Polanyi, and, and uh, uh, we're, we're coming back to these, these central questions. And for me, that meant uh, taking the long view, looking back over uh, not just decades, but centuries, looking at liberal internationalism across uh, the modern era. Uh, uh, liberal internationalism, liberal order did not begin in 1989 or even 1945. It has a longer uh, 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 life uh, as a phenomenon of intellectualizing and, and, and politics, 
going through golden eras and crises. Uh, and indeed, the post-1989 period is a bit of an anomaly. The longer period, uh, uh, obviously most dramatically in the interwar years, has been one of, of, of great contest, uh, close run things, um, uh, a crisis, extinction moments. And the, indeed, the 1930s and early 40s were a kind of touchstone for me. And, and when I did a sabbatical at All Souls uh, two years ago, um, where I did most of the writing for this book, I was more than anything else absorbed in the 1930s and 40s when liberal internationalists who had come out of the Wilson era were rethinking the project, uh, what went wrong, uh, what, are, what are we to do. Uh, Ira Katz Nelson's book, uh, The Des Desolation and, and Enlightenment was a book that, that made a big impact on me. Here we have a portrait of liberals in the, in the 1945 period who have just lived through in just one generation, the Great Depression, totalitarianism, fascism, total war, the Holocaust, the atomic bomb, and now they are trying to say, well, what is the, the prospect for liberal democratic open society? And they picked up the pieces. And so in that, in that spirit, I'm going back and, and looking at, at the ideas, the projects, the, the, the continuities and disjunctures in the liberal international project and really trying to do three things in this book. One is to uh, not write a, an obituary for liberal internationalism, but to, in some sense, to remind us of its gravitas uh, as its, 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 its uh, resiliency, its, uh, its weight as a uh, movement uh, across uh, the modern uh, democratic era as a way of thinking about and acting in international politics. Secondly, to kind, kind of be, uh, uh, show a certain kind of humility about uh, about about it as a tradition to to uh, to assess its strengths and weaknesses to look back at what it's accomplished but also what it's failed to do and in that regard I I do a lot of engagement with realists on the one hand who have a, an argument against liberal internationalism of a certain sort and then I'll call them revisionists on the left who see it much more as kind of complicitous with empire. And indeed, I have a chapter in the book on liberalism and empire, where I think a lot about that. And then finally, I try to make the case that it's not over with, that uh, liberal internationalism has been um, uh, 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 evolved and uh, reimagined in the past, and it could well be in the future. No one knows. There's no definite theory that says in 20 years or 50 years, uh, the world historical uh, uh, development will be will move us to a particular place. We just don't know. But there is a kind of pragmatic, world weary set of ideas here. A kind of you call it a usable past that can be deployed as liberal democracies uh, worry about how they uh, how they uh, can navigate in a world of rising economic and security interdependence. So what is liberal internationalism? Well, uh, like, like Tacitus said about the Roman Empire, it's rich, rich in vicissitudes. It's got a lot in it as a school. And I try to keep it open. It's not a, a dogma. And I try to uh, prevent myself from committing the no true Scotsman fallacy of define it, de defining it by taking people out who don't seem to fit a, a particular model. It's been laissez-faire, it's been social democrat, it's been differently experienced in Europe than the United States than in other places in the 19th through the 20th century. But what has a kind of what it has as a kind of core, I argue in the book, is that, that it's a project for making the world safe for democracy, not in the way that Wilson has been uh, often understood as a kind of promotion of democracy worldwide, but as a, a, a project for building a, a kind of international container in which liberal democracies can survive, be secure, can, can prosper, a kind of, uh, and Dan, you use this term very effectively in your new work, a, a kind of ecosystem or environment, a space for managing mutual vulnerabilities, for doing the work of liberal democracy, which is, uh, managing tensions within the liberal democratic 
um, uh, vision, uh, liberty and equality, uh, individualism and community, sovereignty and interdependence. It's a constant invitation for debate about how you trade things off, how you make compromises, sometimes quite tragic, and creating a zone for cooperation built on a set of convictions about trade, about institutions, about liberal democratic solidarity, uh, and about the, you know, in a world of growing interdependence, uh, we better hang together or we will uh, hang separately. The book tries to make a number of moves to reposition and reframe, uh, if you will, the liberal international uh, project. One is to contrast it with realism, where I try to say that it's it's it, it's interested in some ways in a slightly different problematique uh, uh, in the modern era, not so much the problem of anarchy, although it's concerned with the problem of anarchy, but with the problem of modernity. And so there's been a debate across the 19th century and 20th century and today uh, by liberal liberals and liberal internationalists about the nature of modernity. And Wilson and Roosevelt had different takes on it and th their, their eras did. And in, in, the, you know, in the final instance, it's really a vision of a kind of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde kind of reality that, that modernity is generating great opportunities, but also great dangers. And the liberal international project is about harvesting the benefits and, and uh, uh, guarding against the, the downside. Um, I, I couple just other moves before I talk about the future very briefly. Another move that I make is, is in thinking about liberal internationalism as a bundle of internationalisms. Um, uh, there are many internationalisms out there, as, as Dan Nexon uh, knows in his work, uh, there's lots of internationalism that's, that's illiberal, but there is a bundle that kind of gets braided together and frayed and rebraided across the 19th and 20th century, the trade movement, uh, jurists and, and uh, the arbitration movement, international law, the assembly movements, parliamentary assembly, assembly the peace movement, many of these come together uh, in various ways and then come apart. Wilson in many ways was kind of the, uh, not a creative thinker, but a synthesis, uh, kind of a political, provided a kind of political synthesis of ideas that were already out there. And a lot of writing this book was, wow, we, are, we, we credit Wilson for that idea, but there it is 50 years before. So there's a lot of this kind of putting the, the story together about how these ideas unfold. The other kind of move in the, in the book is to kind of use Wilson and FDR as archetypes. Um, uh, uh, Wilson, uh, a, a kind of, uh, to put it simply, uh, Wilson lived in a moment when it looked like liberal democracy was on the move. Most countries uh, west of Russia in 1920 were some kind of representative democracy. Uh, uh, and in many ways, he saw the moment as one where liberal democracies would, would uh, build on that opportunity to provide the glue for international order. And then uh, 25, 30 years later, under Roosevelt, it was the opposite. It was liberal democracy was in trouble and, and an international order would need to provide the glue to keep liberal democracies together. So much more work had to be done internationally in this what I would call Roosevelt revolution. Uh, and in many ways, that's the inspiration that I would argue uh, we need to draw on today. A kind of uh, the, the, the ideas of security, of, of building a container, a, a, an egg carton for, for liberal democracies that are, that are like eggs or, or a terranium because they're like orchids. Uh, there's a kind of uh, need for uh, a, an international system so that these countries can, can protect their values and, and make these trade-offs. <clears throat> I, I do try to say that across time, there have been four major kind of world historical dramas that have shaped and reshaped liberal internationalism. One is the unfolding of liberal democracy itself, which is, of course, is a story of crisis and change and evolution and uh, inclusion and uh, building on rights and, uh, and uh, protections across the era. Secondly, a movement of the world from a world of, of empire to nation state, extraordinarily important. And liberal internationalism is partly about 
uh, where it plunks down uh, initially with empire, but eventually with nation state um, uh, as a kind of post-imperial set of ideas for organizing the world. Uh, the rise and cascades of, of economic and security interdependence is the third great factor that's structuring the shifts. And then finally, the rise and fall of Anglo-American hegemony. Uh, and so in all these ways, I'm trying to, to some extent, separate liberal internationalism from, from uh, other world forces and to kind of end up here, uh, think of it, uh, the way I kind of think about it is that liberal internationalism is, is as, a, as a tradition alongside other traditions, Marxism, realism, is paradoxical in that it's simultaneously incredibly capacious intellectually, vast horizons, the world is its landscape, but also remarkably thin. It's not a political movement that people march to. People don't go out in the streets to champion liberal internationalism. There's, it's a, it's a, it has a flag without an army. It has always worked with coalitions. It's tied itself like a, uh, you know, like a, a, a like a, 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 a parasite to a host. It, it, it attach, attaches itself to other movements capitalism, nationalism, empire, great power politics, and, and hegemonic projects, um, for better or worse. It, 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 attaching itself to the American era, it made liberal internationalism more uh, amplified, more of a force in world history, but it also took liberal internationalism down paths that America as a great power, as a hegemon, wanted to travel. So it has dirty hands. Um, uh, just finally, with just two minutes left, um, let me just say something about the crisis in the future. I, I have an argument about why things unraveled. And uh, uh, there I, it, I try to, in some sense, make the argument it, it was a, a crisis of, of success, a more, more of a Polanyi crisis than an E.H. Carr crisis. That is to say, uh, the system overran the political foundations of the post-war uh, uh, hegemonic framework, if you will, more peoples and societies doing things. And in some sense, the uh, club-like or conditionality factor that was really the, the, the hallmark of uh, liberal hegemony or the, the post-World War II era where you were in, but not everybody was in. And to be in was to buy into a suite of uh, rights and responsibilities and obligations uh, that that all kind of fell apart after 1989. Uh, and it became not like a club, but more like a shopping mall where people could, and states could come in and out. And it lost a sense of to be in was to, to, to be a, a kind of be in a community with, with rights and club-like responsibilities. So the, for the future, I kind of end with questions about all the great, I think five or six kind of big questions that liberal internationalists need to answer if they want to, find a way to be relevant in a future where it's going to be more crowded, it's going to be more pluralistic, it's not going to be Anglo-American. Uh, but the ideas themselves, if I'm right in this book, are not narrowly uh, and intrinsically Anglo-American. They are ideas that are about uh, really broader uh, uh, aspirations for organizing and living in a world where liber liberal democracies find themselves to be safe. So I'll, I'll end there. Thanks very much. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Stacy or Professor Goddard. I'm gonna do my best here to use honorifics. It's, 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 it, thank you, thank you very much, Professor Nixon. And, and thank you <laughs> for the invitation from Mortara Center. And thank you, Professor Eikenberry, um, for sending along the book. I, I actually, I have to say, um, it was an incredibly engaging read. And in many ways, it was a surprising read. And let me explain why. I've, I feel like in the last decade, or a little less than a decade, I've spent a lot of time with liberal Leviathan. Um, I read it a lot. I end up reading it over and over again for my own work. I teach it. And comparing, I always see liberal Leviathan as a very confident book, confident in the universal nature of, of, of liberal internationalism and where that program is going. And here I felt like I encountered something very different. And to be clear, I still think it's an optimistic read. It's one that still believes very much and has a lot of faith in the liberal international tradition. 
um, one where collective security, human rights, open trade thrive. Um, but I also think it's one that's very thoughtful about the way liberalism much confront, um, just as it's always had to confront uh, different and competing visions about how to cope with this. I, I really like this framing of the problems and opportunities of modernity. Um, so in this tone of the book, liberalism is progressive and it is something that you clearly have a lot of faith in, but it's not something that's triumphant. And I think in this book, you stress much more the idea of liberalism as being part of a struggle for defining the modernity than it is something that is going to kind of naturally and teleologically progress to, to this end. So it was, it was just a very, very different um, type of book. Now, I know, I know that the audience has a lot of questions, so I wanna get out of everybody's way and I'm simply gonna just raise two questions or comments that hopefully can help frame the discussion and really uh, kind of stayed with me as I was reading the book. Um, my first question is whether or not the book goes far enough in thinking and accepting the ways in which commitments to liberalism themselves can produce drives for expansion and drives for imperialism. And I, and I want to be very careful here, especially for people who haven't read the book. Um, Professor Eikenberry faces head on um, the relationship between liberalism and imperialism and the Wilsonian moment and racism. These are not things that are missing from the book. But I think at least the way I read it, that you oftentimes talk about these things as becoming intertwined. They're, they're movements on separate paths that in some ways come together for all sorts of different reasons. And what I guess I would like to push you on is the question of whether or not there are factors endogenous to liberalism that can push it down these paths. And to be clear, not to say that going down that path is inevitable. Right, that would be the argument of realist or revisionist, that liberalism inherently produces this, but still to be able to say that there are factors within liberalism. So for example, take liberals vision of there being a common good, right? The idea that we can in many ways objectively identify collective interests that we should strive for, right? Um, there are things that are silencing in ideas of, of, of collective goods, so the ways in which can drive, a, uh, drive away contestation over different plural interests. And likewise, there is a view, vision of universality here, right? And I think about, for example, when you read the work of John Stuart Mill on imperialism, it doesn't feel like this is just a contingent coming together. That in many ways, works like this really have within them some sort of urge Again, not to say determinism, but an urge towards imperialism that in some ways, in Mill's view, as you note in the book, there's an idea that he has to grapple with a problem of what he sees a lack of development and imperialism becomes an answer to that. The reason I think this is important is not to indict liberalism or to say that it, it, it can't possibly work. But I think one thing that you're concerned about in the book is what are the moments that liberalism goes too far? And in some ways, how do, do liberals need to interrogate themselves and their own ideology to find those endogenous processes that can actually push things down this path? Second question, and then again, I'll, I'll just wrap up. I really did want to push you a bit on your last chapters, the questions of what comes next and understanding that you know, in many ways, wasn't it didn't feel like the driving goal of the book, but it becomes so important. Um, and I certainly hope becomes even more important. Um, I, I think that there's all I was waiting for the moment in the last chapters that you would actually say liberalism once again, or liberal internationalism needs to think of itself as a club. Um, because you talk about the fact that it's overrun its social purpose. And you talk about the fact that it's missing the sense of community, but you don't take that step, right? Nor do you necessarily take the step of talking about whether or not liberalism is at this moment beginning to have to compete with fundamentally different visions of modernity, right? Obviously, you've talked here and in other works about the importance of populist movements and nationalism and those type of turns, but there isn't necessarily the sense of where that struggle is going. If I were to guess, part of this is that I, I, I feel like I've read your work long enough, we've known each other long enough, I know that you're not somebody who's trying to advocate for a new Cold War and for people to move beyond behind these walls, ideological walls and engage in that conflict. But I'm wondering then what, what is the vision there and I'd like to push you on that a bit. Um, you know, the final thing I'll say in conclusion, it just came up as you were talking, is one thing that I've had a surprising kinship here 
was between you and oddly enough, a classical realist, um, this book and the, and the work of Hans Morgenthau. Um, and the reason I say that is because as much we, as we identify Morgenthau with realist, if you look at things like politics among nations and his public writings, he's always so deeply concerned with how it is one keeps democracy at home thriving. And that's always his fundamental driving concern. Um, and that's really what I see in this book. So I think there are actually kind of overlaps between you and that part of the realist community um, that made it really an engaging read. So thank you so much for sharing this with us. Thank, thank you. you, Professor Goddard. Um, so normally this is the time when I would uh, just say, do you want to answer Stacy's questions or do you want to move on to the audience? But actually um, the first question we have is, uh, covers very similar terrain to uh, one of Stacy's questions. So I'm gonna read this to you. It's from Michael Barnett. He says, like many of us, I've been reading quite a bit on race and international relations. One of the conclusions is that race was central to liberal internationalism, or at least a defining and often unapologetic feature of it from the early 19th century through at least World War I. How should we evaluate liberal internationalism in relationship to race? And is, and in the post-war order, has liberal internationalism permitted a racism without racists. Yeah, that, I, that's great. And I'll just tie that to, uh, to Stacy's question. And uh, Michael uh, Barnett, I think, has, has, has asked a, a terrific question. And uh, somebody like me has, has grappled with this in writing this book, uh, because I talk a lot about uh, race and empire and how does liberalism get entangled. And that is the word I tend to use. And I try to resist the it's intrinsically X or intrinsically Y, but but it's 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 in there in some sense. It's I guess the way I I put it, and this this is both a kind of a first cut at the at the answer to to both uh, Stacy and Michael, and that is that liberal ideas both uh, provide uh, and affiliate have in various ways affiliated with. Race and empire uh, provided cover, legitimacy, inspiration, but also the opposite. They've also been on the side of, of inclusion and uh, 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 liberalism, liberal democracy has been, in some sense, the driving uh, uh, set of ideas and institutions that over 200 years successfully put uh, you know, slavery into our past. Uh, that uh, created constitutional shifts in voting and, and uh, citizen rights, uh, not just on the basis of race, but also gender. So in some ways, liberalism is, is, is bipolar. It's, it's on the one hand, it's in the, in the guise of John Stuart Mill in 19th century, and I would say 20th century British internationalists, uh, 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 from uh, Robert Cecil on down, uh, uh, there was an effort to 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 both have it to have it both ways to be uh, upholding uh, liberal international values of rule of law and multilateralism and sovereign equality, and to to uh, to support the empire, which was very deeply a racial uh, hierarchy uh, 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 that was embedded within it. Um, so I, I, I see it as deeply implicated, uh, it entangled, but also the ideas uh, have, uh, uh, liberal ideas have been uh, in some sense the, the, the weapons for uh, liberation uh, uh, for people inside of the Western societies trying to gain equality and status and respect and more broadly in very problematic ways around the world. Um, so you think of, of uh, in, liberal democracies have, have in, in a kind of strange way uh, during the two wars have uh, found uh, themselves uh, with leaders who are forced to make the case for why we would fight wars. And they in so, some sense engaged in idealism inflation. They, the wars were not just about putting Germany down, but making the world safer for democracy. And then FDR for freedoms, the Atlantic Charter. Now you may say that that was propaganda and it was uh, uh, made uh, with kind of instrumental motives in mind, but it also put a predicate down. Uh, it, it created uh, 
understandings of how we're going to measure our post-war order, and therefore it created a kind of uh, a, a kind of standard or uh, measure of legitimacy that it fell short of, but that provided uh, the basis for for struggle. It's it's. So the the leaders themselves, starting with with Woodrow Wilson, who was deeply racist, uh, the the ideas uh, may not have been genuinely embraced or fully embraced or embraced only partially with a great deal of moral blindness. But you know, as 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 Oscar Wilde said in one of his writings, the value of an idea is not measured by the sincerity of the person who utters it. Uh, and so the the ideas that we associate with uh, equality, inclusion, uh, it's the liberal tradition. It hasn't been rival grand traditions of modernity that have offered greater opportunity both in principle and in practice. So um, no liberal state has ever behaved or acted in international affairs fully or exclusively on the basis of liberal principles discussion of human rights in the liberal tradition is always inherently uh, infused with hypocrisy and double standards. But the vision of order that liberal internationalists have, have, have put out there creates a kind of platform or an, or an imperfect order in which uh, struggle can take place to bring those liberal societies and that international system of liberal societies closer to their founder, founding ideals. So in that sense, my answer is yes and no. Um, it's got dirty hands, but it also has uh, ideas that have been uh, with allies of various sorts put, been put to good use to bring us closer to the kind of societies we wanna live in. So the next question we have is also related, this one to Stacy's third question, as is the question after that, but so, um, I, I just want to say in advance, uh, I will mispronounce Smith about 30% of the time. So don't take it personally, but I'm about to mutilate a bunch of people's names. Uh, so the next question is from uh, Farhan uh, Siddiqui. Uh, and the question is essentially about this problem of the rise of uh, authoritarian market powers in China specifically. Um, and there's a little bit of a preamble, but the specific question uh, is, and I'm reading here, will the coming China-US rivalry be decided or regulated by strategic competition, external to the sort of domestic makeup of those states, or by a domestic liberal political challenge to the Chinese regime? Um, perhaps a repeat of the Soviet Union and an increased authoritarianism led to mass discontent in the system's failure. Uh, and a, a kind of broader spin of this question is the very, the very kind of fraught and sometimes tension-filled relationship, which your book talks about and Stacey has invoked, between the sort of domestic domestic political liberal orders in their economic and political side, and then international liberalism as a regulatory cooperation framework. Uh, and so I think there's a kind of broader broader aspect to this as well. Yeah, that's, that's, that's important. And maybe that's, this is the point where I can uh, uh, talk about Stacey's a question about the club and the kind of underdeveloped last argument about how, how one builds an international order to to secure particular social purposes. And that, that relates to China. I, the, I was writing a book about China and liberal order, uh, but I put it down to give these lectures. And then I wrote this book uh, based on those lectures. So I, I guess one critique of the book would be, I don't talk about China enough. And I I, I, it doesn't get a full chapter. I don't really fully tease out the implications. But um, I guess one of the things that, that comes out right at the very end that I, I didn't really have a strong view at the beginning of writing this was that I do think that um, rebuilding the club character of, of liberal democracy is probably going to be necessary if these countries are to uh, to secure their social purposes. So I, I think of it this way, and I have a kind of double image in the book of universal principles of Westphalian internationalism are kind of the default um, uh, product of the uh, 
uh, of the transition from a world of 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 empire to post empire world. It, it became the the most uh, broadly legitimate principles for for um, for organizing the world, sovereign equality. Uh, the United Nations embraces and embodies it, uh, uh, and that that is the world where the United States and China are very much in the same uh, uh, on the same platform in the same world. But that that is a a a, a framework and set of principles for international order that, in many ways, doesn't provide the protective mechanisms for liberal democracies to secure their social purposes. So we all know uh, John Ruggie brilliantly gave us a vision of this, of, of, of embedded liberalism that we, we created after World War II, uh, mechanisms that were one step above and not simply reducible to Westphalian internationalism, and a, a, a kind of framework where countries with similar expectations and desires to uh, have uh, social democratic uh, domestic systems to provide uh, tools for governments to stabilize and manage uh, their domestic economies to achieve or pursue at least uh, goals of full employment and economic stability, that these sorts of social purposes required building a kind of subsystem among countries of like-minded purpose. And what I tell at the end of the book is, is the unraveling of that, the, the, the erosion of liberal uh, embedded liberalism. Uh, neoliberalism, of course, is always the other side of that story, what happened. But it, it seems to me that, that if you are going to have a, if liberal democracies want to live in a world where they can protect and advance their social purposes in a world where other kinds of states don't have those goals, they have to work in a, in a subset. They have to work in some kind of club. They have to do things that will not be universal. Uh, and so in that sense, I am um, arguing that uh, uh, there needs to be some, some uh, creative refashioning of, of a liberal democratic world, call it a club. Uh, it, 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 it needs to be a different one than perhaps uh, was so prevalent during the, the Cold War. But uh, I, I think high, the, the, the higher order, the kind of political order you're trying to build, the, the more complicated, more complex with, with more social purposes, the harder it is to reconcile that with a universalistic Westphalian order. Uh, so you kind of need, uh, you need a, a, an agenda that, that does separate yourself from the rest of the world. And in that sense, uh, the, the US and other liberal democracies will want to do things that, that take them away from China, that, that separate them from China, that may in fact be uh, partly driven by the worry that a global system dominated by illiberal states where the liberal democratic portion is increasingly small relative to the whole is a world where they, their institutions and values are ever more jeopardized. So you have to kind of build protective structures uh, in a shrinking space to protect things that you really, really care about. You don't simply care about anarchy and solving problems of anarchy. You care about um, the kind of values, open, open societies and an open system. That's a very, very complicated set of goals to have an open society, free speech, open uh, in terms of a movement of, of, of people and ideas and trade and, and to, to have that domestic system reconciled with an open system in an era where pandemics and proliferation of weapons and all the rest come your way requires a fairly extensive and sophisticated kind of superstructure of cooperation to succeed with that balancing act. And so that's where I, I think I hint at that at the end of the book, but I think there's much more thinking to do and uh, creative uh, thinking to do in that in that in that area. So the next question is actually on you've partially answered, uh, which is from Anne uh, Fiorini. 
uh, and she asks about the community of democracies, which is something that it sounds like you advocate. <laughs> and, uh, but she wants to know um, how could this be structured and implemented in ways that would provide the support needed to sustain liberal democracy. And I think, you know, listening to you talk, you've identified a lot of the core problems, right? And I think these also relate to the prior question, core problems about how you, if you are carving out a, say, a subspace safe for liberalism, uh, but you're dealing with extraterritorial extra authoritarianism, right? How do you equilibrate that? Um, it also relates in some ways to the, I, the, the sort of prior question, if the persistence of su relatively successful regimes that um, have different attitudes towards domestic democracy and domestic political liberties is threatening to one another, right? How then does the community of democracies work without dealing more extensively with strategic competition or with liberal enlargement or with um, you know, uh, sort of traditional strategic threats. In other words, how do we, to Stacey's question, how do we wind up not being in a new Cold War uh, if that's the case? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Uh, you know, I think we should pause and kind of reflect on, isn't this interesting? We're talking about liberal democracy. In, in some ways, what's in, I've had a 30 some year career this is really the last five or six years are the first time I have felt like I've had to think about a world where liberal democracy is kind of uh, fading and kind of unraveling and uh, it's it may be uh, something that will will uh, uh, increasingly be a kind of luxury good that some can afford but most people can't and uh, so there you go the 21st century uh, takes us in a very different direction. So I, I, so I, I do think that thinking about how you protect certain things you value, uh, starting with you know speech and freedom of information and a civil society, uh, um, enlightenment values, I guess you'd say liberal enlightenment values. And so, so I, 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 in that sense, I feel kinship with Isaiah Berlin and that generation who were who were saying, uh, we can't think about a world where, where we perfect things and make it good for everybody and solve all problems. We've got to sort of, we've got to sort of survive so that we can live another day to, to pass on certain things we want to our children. So that, that's, I've never, I don't remember ever talking that language in, in, in earlier decades of, of IR debate. So, so I'm, I'm kind of on new terrain here thinking about, okay, so what, what it means, and this is kind of just a, a, a background point, we, we all on this panel and probably in the audience are debating and theorizing the nature of international order. And it seems to me that, this is not in the book, but I'm thinking more along these lines now, that what, what do people do when they go into the international system to, to struggle over order? And it seems like there are four things they do that aren't always consistent. One is they, they, they want to solve problems of anarchy and secure themselves. That's the realist agenda. Secondly, they want to manage their interdependence, the trade-offs between sovereignty and interdependence. That's something that is, is cuts across the, the eras. Thirdly, they try to create, as I've suggested in my book, to create superstructures internationally that bias international politics in ways that support and protect valued domestic institutions. And then finally, the fourth thing that people do when they go into the system to struggle over order is to, to pursue a, a, a social justice of one kind or another. And I think all of that, so, so we have different states, different people, different movements in the international space at the same time doing different things trying to achieve different goals. And I think, I, I'm not saying that the, the protect the world, at, uh, protect uh, liberal democracy is, is the only thing we should be doing internationally, but I do think that um, it, uh, it, it does entail this kind of um, creating uh, and rehabilitating the space in which, which these states live. And, and I'm just going to Throw it back to you, Dan. Could could you sharpen the question so that I can answer a more specific framing of the question? 
Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sort of trying to roll things together and I may be uh, diluting the question. So I think the, the, the last question, the question that was passed on to us um, has a very, you know, has a very specific kind of bottom line, which is um, how do you actually implement something like that, right? You know, I mean, we can talk about the trade-offs, but what do you do to produce a community of democracies that can protect uh, democracy within yeah. the sphere of that community? Yeah, I... Uh, I think um, there there is a kind of I, 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 how do you and, and the other part of the question how do you do that and this is what I think uh, uh, Stacy was getting at how do you do that without igniting a cold war with China and how do you both not have a cold war with China and acknowledge that there may be multiple modernity projects in play now China. You know, uh, Jurgen Habermas, a kind of modernity project idea that uh, China may, maybe not, it may succeed, may not succeed, uh, be pursuing a different model in the deepest sense of model uh, 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 for, for navigating uh, 21st century modernity. Uh, how do we, and if we don't like that world, if we don't want to live in that world, how do we protect the kind of world we want to live in? But how do we do that without igniting a cold war? I, I think, I've always thought that you know, you know, George Kennan's last statements in his long telegram that no one remembers about, it's it's not really what you do vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. It's how you take care of your own society and people that really will matter. Because if you if you don't have, you know, a, a thriving, healthy society, it's like diseased tissue that's easily. Uh, 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 the source for a predatory outsider to come after. So you you make make you know you create you put your own house in order. You you re-legitimate your institutions. You elect politicians who will rebuild the social safety net. Uh, uh, um, and 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 you can't simply go back to the golden era of embedded liberalism. But you've got to find some way to connect uh, an open international order with with a safe world for everyday people living with worried about everyday things. If you don't, it becomes a kind of highfalutin agenda for for uh, global elites. And I, 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 I resist that caricature, which which liberal internationalists have been injured by, namely that it's all about promoting globalism. It's about creating partnerships to manage interdependence, which is different. And uh, it, it, it means that you will regulate and you will safeguard and you will protect. It's not simply free trade and everything else is secondary. So I, I think that's number one. I, and then I think kind of informal cooperation, you know, that I, I've suggested in one article, you know, the D10, D12, uh, D is a great word because it, it's different than G. <laughs> it's uh, democracy. Uh, it's uh, a kind of a, a informal coalition of states that that want to push uh, reform of, and drive the reform agenda for international institutions. At some point, we will kind of come to rock bottom in terms of the unraveling of the, the system. Institutions have lost all of their efficacy. There's almost no enthusiasm uh, for international cooperation. At whatever point you kind of say that's the, the bottom, we've reached the bottom in world historical perspective, then who's going to be taking you back up? And I hope that liberal internationalists can do that with a kind of more sensible, world-weary, pragmatic, reform-oriented agenda that doesn't scare people off, that's, that, that builds it around growth coalitions and, um, and, and that doesn't totally write off China because we, China did not turn out the way many liberals thought China would when liberals were theorizing order in the 90s, including myself. But you know, it's you know, you play for the long game. Woodrow Wilson said, I'm playing for a hundred years. So you're trying to figure out what things do you want to have in place in the middle part of the 21st century so that you can bias the, the flow in your direction. And so it doesn't have to be a alliance of democracies, uh, but some kind of infrastructure that lead, lets these states struggle over 
what kind of values do you want to have embedded in international institutions? China is eating the the liberal the liberals' lunch, so to speak, in hollowing out institutions and offering alternative, more Westphalian kinds of uh, values to to put into these institutions: Human Rights Council, uh, uh, hollowing out R two P. Lots of different different ways in which the struggle, surprisingly, is a struggle inside of institutions, not a revisionist attempt to impose a different system, but to work inside. I think that's happening more than many people thought it would happen. So that's a very interesting development, but it, it tells us one thing about what the coalitional framework should be to, to push back. So we have um, 11 minutes of official time left. Uh, uh, Professor Eikenberry uh, has agreed to stay on for maybe 10 or 15 more minutes if it comes to that. Uh, so, but we do have three questions and they're meaty questions. So I wanna get to them. So the first one in the queue is from William Lawrence and it says, how do you read the Arab Spring protests continuing now in Algeria, Sudan, Lebanon and Iraq vis-a-vis -vis the spring of nations in 1848, et cetera? Uh, is it, it post-ideological or is it just a rearticulation of inclusive citizen rights-based liberalism? Wow. I, <laughs> uh, Stacy, do you want to uh, help me out here? Um, let, let me actually uh, ask you a, a kind of question that follows from that, because I think the question of whether it's you know, a kind of real call for liberalism, whether it's post-ideological, ties into this issue with the D10, D12 proposal, right? Which is that um, oftentimes, when we talk about the D10 or D12, we're mostly talking about consolidated democracies, which are almost universally in the global north, um, which with a few exceptions are white European or settler, you know, or European settler units. Uh, and that does kind of raise issues about um, the sort of West or the greater rest as a, an exclusive uh, ethnically racially marked community. Um, you know, even if India is in the D12, it's, you know, it's still an Anglophone quote unquote country in, in that sense. But, that you, but you, this happens that even if you did that, you have an environment where there are democratizing movements and there are less consolidated democracies that would presumably be outside of them, right? Um, so how do those countries respond to Arab Springs? How do those countries uh, manage the idea of protecting themselves without starting a new Cold War uh, with the idea that there will be um, aspirations and agitations for democratization uh, in countries, uh, most often of which are in the global south? Yeah, Stacy, yeah, I, I, I'll also chime in in a second. I, I would actually, I, would, I almost want to tie this question to something that you said in, in your talk, John, that kind of surprised me, which you said, um, you know, liberal, I guess liberal internationalism, not liberalism, but liberalism in, in the idea of like always finds other movements, right? Um, but I'm, is that really the case, right? I mean, we see these movements, um, which I mean, obviously have nationalism uh, as, as well, but they really are movements and, and parts of this struggle, right? Um, and moreover, your own book has a lot, especially in the 19th century, about this, this struggle, this, it's that liberalism is a revolutionary force, right? Um, so I think that that ties in with how do we see those and, 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 and how do we include those revolutionary movements as, as, as part of this organization of democracies? Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, um, actually, in a conversation some weeks ago with Miles Kaler, he he made the 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 argument that liberalism is is kind of I, I think he made the, he said that in a kind of strong version of the argument that liber, liberal societies are ones where there's a kind of expectation of of kind of evolving you know an ever uh, you know a more perfect union. Uh, think about Obama's eulogy to, to uh, John Lewis, Representative Lewis, where he said, you know, we, we, you know, we, we've been given instructions, a uh, uh, construction manual to make a more per perfect union, which means that it's not perfect now. And, we, and, and so it, it, in both inside of these societies and across societies, there's a sense of, of kind of, of becoming, uh, of, of everything is not finished. There are people and, and prospects that have to be lifted up. Uh, in various ways, and so that, that kind of inclusiveness, I think, gets you to 
to why after the Cold War ended, you, 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 it was just impossible not to sort of, uh, to, to say, to, it was impossible to say no to those reform democratizing uh, societies on the side of, of Eastern Europe and elsewhere who were making these transitions. And I, I think uh, it really does matter what the core states do in the face of spring, Arab Springs. Um, uh, my colleague here at, uh, at Princeton, uh, uh, um, Carlos Bosch, has a wonderful APSR article where he shows there is a correlation, indeed causation, uh, uh, between having a, a powerful set of states that want to see the system uh, uh, be supportive of liberal uh, democratic transitions and consolidations. And so whether it's trade or aid or inclusion in membership organizations, it, 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 there's those, there, you can't t say and, and predict when a democratic revolution may occur. Uh, uh, you, you, you just, it's hard to, to know when a kind of upheaval will, will unfold, but, um, but it, they're more likely to take a, get a kind of foothold and, and sustain themselves if there's a congenial international support system, so to speak. And so I, I think that's as far as I would go, ex except to say that, that uh, the, the white northern western societies have been, you know, have a very mixed record on that. You know, sometimes they've, they've opened themselves up, you know, they've, they've done things that have had real impact. I, you know, in East Asia, I, I do think there's a, there's a story there uh, about uh, Japan, but even perhaps more so profoundly with South Korea, of, of a country that kind of used the framework of a liberal order to uh, throw off military dictatorship and become a, a thriving democracy and, and to move from a kind of south to north uh, profile, the first country to be a recipient of ODA to actually be a provider of ODA. So I, I, I think there's kind of, you know, there, there, there are kind of fragmentary things out there that help us know how to to respond to movements for for freedom and and liberation uh, on the periphery of this of this system so i have, there are three more questions in the queue two of them are sort of on this broad topic one of them relates to the challenge of chinese multilateralist uh multilateralism chinese uh, illiberal activities in the un the belt and road initiative Another one of that is a sort of, I think, a pointed question about the ability, how, whether this can all work if the U.S. is not willing to provide the club goods to sustain it. But I want to get to a different question first and then come back to those. And this is from Brian Schmidt. Uh, and, uh, and he asks, is not openness, the continual pursuit of this by the U.S., part of the problem that uh, we're in today? I am picking up on the open door school of diplomatic history, which has argued that the open door is nothing more than imperialism that has been ongoing since the late 1800s, right? So it's the, the sort of the, the question of, yeah, I mean, it is what it is. It's the question of, are, are you just kind of re narrating a nicer version of um, uh, the US pushing, you know, of liberalism pushing openness as a way of uh, engaging in, uh, capitalist imperialist expropriation and exploitation yeah i you know uh i guess i probably should uh should should resist that argument uh, you know there's something to it uh i guess maybe it's useful since a lot of people would say yes that's probably true how could i say maybe it's not entirely true so um I do think that in the 20th century, the liberal international project was eventually tied to building uh, institutions with principles that went beyond empire and went beyond, um, we'll call it spheres of influence. Um, and that was on balance a progressive move, although it was not always driven as I think probably the question Questioner probably would would definitely agree with, with noble purposes of, uh, of of openness so that everybody is equal. Uh, a lot of openness uh, came out of American foreign policy 
as it tried to use its elbows to break down empires so it could have some, some ac market access to Eurasia, uh, the grand area, uh, which was the great concept that drove American post-World War II order building that came out of the studies for what do, can we live in a world where it's all imperial systems, uh, hemispheric regional systems? Can the US be just a, a empire inside of the Western, Western hemisphere? And the answer was, you know, uh, 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 Hansen and uh, uh, and uh, uh, other uh, 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 Nicholas Spickman, other theorists made uh, were quite definitive. No, you have to have access, and that's of course the open door. What the open door was not a terribly enlightened policy, but it was. It wasn't saying do not imperialize China. It was saying do it on a non-discriminatory basis imperial basis. So uh, everybody should have access. It shouldn't be carved up and given private imperial uh, control. So yes, it is. Openness has not been the antithesis of empire, but it it's, it's a cognate with multilateralism as well. And uh, openness uh, does, uh, uh, you know, in the kind of sense of, of Ruggie's multilateralism, a set of principles for how we interact that's not, that's not der derivative of power configurations. There's a kind of principled basis for interaction. Again, that's, have states lived up to that? Not so much, but it is in some sense the isomorphic architectural feature that would come from liberal internationalism and not from realism or not from Marxism or mar not from uh, fascism, or you know, so it's 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 the body of ideas that you can build on to move in progressive directions. So I, I guess that's how I would and think about the American era, which you know gets a lot of bad press uh, for being kind of just neo, not 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 liberal, but neo imperial. It, it there was a lot of uh, killing off empires, uh, again, not always for lofty reasons, but for geopolitical purposes. If you can't control Southeast Asia, you certainly don't want somebody else to, like, like, like Japan. So there is a kind of instrumentalism to the openness agenda, but it has the effect of creating space and, and, pre and preventing the emergence and, and consolidation of a world built around spheres, imperial spheres of influence. And that would seem to be the, those influence spheres would seem to be the enemy of weak societies trying to break free. So um, the, the two last questions we have, and this is a where we're, thank everybody for coming. Obviously we are at the end of official time, but um, we will be taking a little bit more time. I think I'd like to throw this open to state, may explicitly throw this question open to Stacy as well, right? So these are two questions I've mentioned about, um, uh, I'll, I'll briefly uh, read them, but uh, Daniel Lem says, Dr. Eikenberry, thanks so much for all of this, um, uh, wants to know that how, you know, China is not only attempting to reshape existing multilateral institutions from within, but also trying to create new and perhaps parallel systems, the AAIB, the you know, BRI, all these uh, quadrillion multilateral forums that China's built, uh, and asks how these efforts affect the project to expand liberal internationalism. And Greg Sanders has a question about essentially, uh, as, I, as I summarized before, that the U.S. has become, seems to be increasingly willing to provide club goods. Uh, and other kinds of international goods. And of course, what Daniel Lum's question concerns is the willingness of China to provide a lot of private and club goods mm -hmm. uh, in the system uh, and the way that's affecting their bargaining leverage in international, both within the incumbent institutions, but also the new institutions of international order. Um, and so uh, Greg Sanders you know, says, uh, asks, um, uh, the US may be less interested in being a hegemonic uh, bill payer for various club goods if this is a renewed club infrastructure, has a less centralized distributions of costs and benefits, how the arrangement look different, what older approaches may uh, no longer work if there's less emphasis on a lead country, right? So, so I'd like to kind of bundle those together as a big set of questions about, about uh, goods provision, uh, the reshaping of international order, um, and 
how the, in, 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 that ties back into this question of how do we make this kind of arrangement work? And because if you don't know, Stacey Goddard's done uh, really, Professor Goddard's done top-notch work on how uh, the infrastructure of institutions shapes revisionist uh, revisionist uh, strategies and revisionist dynamics. So I think has a lot to say here. So Stacey, why don't you go first? Yeah. Sure. Um... So I no I think I think that the easy answer, especially to 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 to, to the first question, is that uh, I think it's going to have an extraordinarily significant impact. Um, and I say this even though completely accepting that, a China says that these institutions are designed in many ways to enhance and increase um, the architecture of liberal economic institutions. Right, China said very clearly that these are not meant to be competing institutions. Um, for example, Belt and Road is supposed to be the hardware of of of, of trade to 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 other um, institutions, software, so to speak. Um, but I think, despite that. Um, when, when I've looked at revisionist states in the past, when we see these types of growth of new networks, um, they end up creating different types of opportunities. So it's not necessarily, what I'm not saying is that China has some sort of grand plan to counter liberal internationalism or an ideology that says they're going to pop up and say, ah, now we have you. But I think basically, eventually, this will become the infrastructure to, to, to new organizations. Um, and a, a, a new type of logic of orders. And I think, by the way, that's one of the reasons, John, that I was, and I, I wanna sit and think about it for a while, the idea, one thing I've been wondering to the extent to which China and particularly under Xi has begun in many ways to see itself as organizing modernity in a different way, right? Because that in many ways is the ideological portion that I think has been missing as to how these organizations play and how they actually are situated next to, to liberal international order. Um, that's kind of my, I'm happy to turn it back over to you. Yeah, um, it's that's great. And uh, um, I, I, I this, I'll, I'll just pick up on the club goods thing. I, I you know, I, I wrote the book trying to separate liberal internationalism from America uh, because I wanted to, uh, in some sense, uh, it was both a defensive move that not everything the United States has done is a test of whether liberal internationalism is good or bad, and including uh, uh, the Iraq war, which I, I, uh, Dan Doody and I have some arguments on, and I, I rehearse some of them in the book on in the chapter on empire and intervention. But um, even having done that, and and here we are, you know, a few days from an election, it seems like the world could go two different, very different ways, and it's it, it could be, uh, uh, you know, springtime or winter uh, uh, in a matter of, of hours from now. Um, the, um, the the U.S. does more than I kind of let on in the book. Uh, does seem to be very important if there's going to be another cycle of history that is has has these liberal international characteristics. Um, and I've always thought that the US had a real interest and in, in incentive to do that because it was it, its best decades have been ones where it's, uh, you know, it's done well and good at the same time. Um, and the US is kind of in, in kind of historical terms, it's very interesting. America has gotten more powerful, gotten more liberal at the same time it became more powerful, which is kind of interesting in the, in the progressive era, you, the kind of the US engaging in the world, partly because it was always struggling against illiberal states that in some sense incentivized it to emphasize its liberalism. And, you know, uh, uh, in the Cold War to, 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 uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, Make good on on racial justice uh, uh, and voting rights uh, uh, um, uh, movements and so forth. So the U.S. is kind of a leader, a goods provider. I kind of think it's 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 it, if not indispensable, it's very important. Uh, and um, and you know I know Dan, you've got a, a very important book arguing that that there are rival goods providers, and so the United States partly will see its decline manifest as the substitution of American provide goods by other rival great powers. And I think that's, I, I think, in, I, I, I acknowledge and accept that what my first response to you on that is that 
the, the, those rivals have been there before and it, it provided a kind of impetus for the US to compete. Uh, and one could imagine without changing too many assumptions to think the US might find a, a, a rival China as a stimulant for more kind of Marshall Plan kind of kind of behavior to 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 outbid China in in the Philippines or you know to make sure that uh, that South Korea doesn't flip by being the 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 stable provider of regional security. So um, so I think that you put your finger on something very important. I think you that you need to have those kind of inside the system goods you need leadership matters more than some of our structural theories suggest um and you know i i it, it's a real kind of question mark whether the united states can overcome its its severe uh, polarized traumas to 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 play a kind of kind of role a, a system functional role again, like it has in the past. I, I think that's a wild card that none of us know the answer to. One thing I would just say here is that competition has been a double edged sword for US liberalism and for global liberalism. So you're exactly right that uh, charges of hypocrisy, particularly in the context of, of uh, racial injustice, were very effective at pushing the United States uh, to reform, I, uh, I'm sorry, I, my screen froze for a second. Um, we're very effective at, at pushing the United States to make really crucial reforms, and that um, that it created an incentive for the United States to make this, you know, make its system deliver the goods more. Um, it also, of course, um, did result in some kinds big democratizing initiatives like the Marshall Plan. Um, on the flip side, though, uh, it also competition often, I think, led the U.S. to race to the bottom, mm -hmm. right, to prefer authoritarian regimes, uh, to not care about conditions on aid that might uh, have helped with transparency or might have helped domestic actors who wanted to democratize. Um, you know, Korea is a success story in the 80s for democratization, but it's not a success story before that with and often with U.S. assistance. The same thing with the Philippines. Uh, and and even you know Japan right is a country where the United States tax right in many ways once the Soviet threat uh, starts to grow and is less supportive of labor unions and less support less supportive of things that might have made for a even more open democratic Japan right and uh, finally of course we have McCarthyism we have various kinds of ways in which competition has ideological competition has been used to shut down dissent in the United States. So I'm kind of, I, I just would sort of raise the issue that um, there's a lot of indeterminacy there. And, and it, right now it could feel like that would look like a good thing, but you could also imagine this going south really quickly. Um, and I don't really know how we, how we resolve that. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a, that's a good point. I mean, um, it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, I've, I've been struck how across 200 years uh, how how much the international agenda has been tied to how these liberal democracies are are solving problems and struggling over issues domestically and you know, in 19th century the reform liberalism in Britain was very important for uh, certain kinds of internationalism that uh, you, we, you associate with um, uh, you know the Hague conferences and uh, uh, in, in the progressive period, you've got, you know, Wilson in New, New Deal, uh, Great Society, you have all these kind of moments where um, domestic reform and movements uh, spill over internationally and, and, how the, and how the international setting itself then feeds back, uh, either creating um, incentives for establishment figures to be more forthcoming on social justice issues because the world is a stage and everybody's watching. So there's, a, there's some evidence of that. It's kind of an, a weak effect. You know, F, JFK going to Geneva, not wanting to have civil rights violence in the streets when 
his great counterpart who is offering a different vision of the workers' paradise is, is going to be there. The kind of uh, international context for domestic struggles is, is a complicated one, as you say, and it does cut both ways. And um, the, today we can, you know, we can see that in full display. So I think uh, we're about to wrap up. I want to ask Stacy if she has any last comments or, or reactions to, to things that have gone down in this conversation or the questions that we're wrestling with right now. No, um, except that I'm looking forward to the other, I think, five books you said you were going to write during this talk, John. <laughs> I may be done. Who knows? <laughs> Well, I wanted to thank again, uh, both uh, Professor Eikenberry and Professor Goddard for sharing their time with us today and, and their ideas. And I wanna thank everybody who, who came, many of whom are still here. Uh, and I do apologize, I, my efforts to maybe rope questions together may have uh, meant that your questions weren't answered as, as well as they might be, but I'm sure you can reach out to the participants and you know, ask them directly in, in some form. So uh, again, thank you very much. And uh, hopefully we'll see you at other Matara Center uh, book talks and events. Thank you. thank you, Dan. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you. Bye.